Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Amen. If you would remain standing and open up your Bibles now to Acts chapter 22. Acts 22. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Um, if you were not with us, uh, Paul is now back in Jerusalem. Uh, there was a bit of a riot last week, and he was getting beaten up, and the Roman soldiers had stepped in, and um, he ends up on the steps of the Antonia Fortress, and he asked to speak to the people, and they listen to him as he shares his testimony, which is where we pick things up down, and I'm going to start in verse 21 of Acts chapter 22, um, where Paul kind of finishes what he was sharing. He says this, he says, Then he said to me, speaking of Jesus, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law. And do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. As Chuck mentioned, um, Paul was in Jerusalem. And for some time, he had been pressing back toward Jerusalem in order to be there. And along the way, he had talked to the elders of Ephesus at Miletus. And he proclaimed to them, he told them, he said, look, 
And see now, I go bound. Actually, this was in Ephesus before that. He says, I, I go bound in the Spirit, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city that chains and tribulations await me. And so as he proclaimed that to them, he was making a prophetic declaration of what he understood, what he knew was going to happen as he went to Jerusalem. And so then we saw how they stopped at Tyre, and he was told at Tyre, you know, by the people speaking in the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem, right? And then he was told in Caesarea um, with Agabus that the one who owns this belt will be bound in the same manner as when he goes to Jerusalem. And so it didn't take Paul by surprise then when he went to Jerusalem and these things began to happen. And last week, as Chuck was talking about, we began to see the fulfillment of this prophetic declaration that Paul um, submits to the, the elders of Jerusalem and goes to fulfill his own vow to the Lord. And so he goes to the temple, into the, the, the temple court, okay, to do these things. And while he's in the temple court, he is falsely accused of bringing a Gentile into the, into the temple. And that would contaminate the temple. Immediately the temple was shut down. But what it means to Paul is at that moment, even though it's a false accusation, it doesn't really matter, at that point he's grabbed, he's dragged, and he's brought out of the temple. And again, last week I mentioned how I think that was coming out of the southern part. Okay, And he's brought out into the street, and he's being bit, uh, beaten and, 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 and uh, prepared to be stoned probably at that moment, just like he oversaw the stoning of Stephen. Now he was about ready to have that happen to him as well. And so he's being beaten on. Well, someone runs up to Antonio's fortress, which is on the, the upper end of the, the temple from our, our viewpoint here. And so they let them know, the Roman soldiers, come on down. They grab him. They take him back to, to Antonio's fortress. Along the way, the commander of the army is told multiple things about Paul. Um, who he is. Everybody's trying to kind of let him know who this guy is. And so um, Paul gets up to the, the top of the steps. He's being carried. Remember, he's being carried. He's chained. He's being carried. And he, and he turns to the commander and he speaks in Greek, which is surprising, shocking to the, the commander because the commander says to him, aren't you the Egyptian? Da, 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 da. And he says, no, that's not me. You know? And so he gives him permission to speak to the people. But then when he lets them down and Paul begins to speak to the people, Paul starts to speak in Hebrew, okay? So now he speaks in Hebrew and the people are hushed as they're listening to him. And he's declaring to them how the, the message of, of Christ came to him, how he heard the voice of Jesus as he was on his way to Damascus because he was going to Damascus to persecute the church. But he heard the voice of Jesus on the way there. And everybody's hushed, everybody's listening, everybody's hanging on every word, until he comes to the point then where he says, and that Jesus, later when he comes to Jerusalem, the word of Jesus comes to him, and Jesus tells him that he's going to send them, send Paul to the Gentiles. And when he speaks the deplorable word, right, at that moment, the crowd goes bonkers. The crowd goes crazy at that moment. And so um, they pick him up, they, they, they drag him into the the fortress, and now the, the next step of what we're going to talk about begins to happen because now the Roman commander wants to know who this guy is. Normal, the path of, of doing this normally would be you beat it out of them. Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, kid, kid disobeys, you grab the kid, you beat the truth out of him. No, <laughs> no, no, no. But that's how the Romans would do it. And that begins what we fall into, what begins to happen with Paul. Now, as I go into this, I need to continue to remind myself, and so this is an all-play moment, Paul was just an ordinary guy. Paul was just an ordinary guy. Because a lot of times, what we're going to read about, we think, but that's Paul. Super Paul. You know, just below Super Jesus, you know, there's Super Paul. We have Super Peter you know, all these other super Johns and all this kind of stuff, right? And so those are the guys that were in tight with Jesus. They got a special blessing from him, and they're able to handle things like nobody else was able to handle things. But Paul was just an ordinary guy. But he had an extraordinary calling. But he was an ordinary guy 
who was fully sold out for the kingdom of God. And I think there's that combination. He may be an ordinary guy who has a calling from God, but honestly, I can look out, and I'm going to look out to everybody right now, right? Try to I'm make a point. I'm going to do this, right? And we were talking about, I, I, there's a lot of times, I'm not a public speaker, and if you think I'm looking at you, probably I'm not looking at you. I might be literally looking at you in the eye, but I promise you, inside me, I'm not looking at you at all. I am just like vacant at this moment because I'm not a public speaker. And I have to draw myself at these moments where I, I am going to look at you, right? Um, that you are an ordinary person. But every single one of us has an extraordinary calling. And I, and I want you to understand that's so important. It's important for Bob to have understood in his life. I have an extraordinary calling. And it's not because I'm a pastor. It's not because I'm a teacher. I'm a child of God. Do you get that? I mean, God has done something special for me that he's done for you. And you have the privilege of being an ambassador of Christ, of going forth with his message of reconciliation to the whole world. And we squander it. We squander our extraordinary calling on the frivolous stuff of the world. And you're, one day you're going to get to your deathbed. And you're going to ask yourself the question that everybody asks when they die. What did I do with my life? And there's lots of people who are going to have regrets. I wish I would have. I wish I would have. I want to be like Paul. I want to be able to say I ran the race. I finished my course. I've done everything that God has asked me to do. Do I squander time? I do. I wish I redeemed time better than I do. I've shared this in the past. But the secret to a fulfilled Christian life, according to Bob, the redemption of that which cannot be saved, to invest in the redemption of that which can be saved by laying all that I am on the altar that he may alter all that I am. I just want you to think about that. You can't save time. Jim Croce used to sing that, right? If I could save time in a bottle and da 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 da, da you know, the, the first thing I'd do, spend all of eternity with you. You can't save time in a bottle. It just doesn't happen. You've already wasted or used up, however you want to look at it, so many hours today. They're not coming back. They're gone. Did you use them properly? Did you use them frivolously? Did you spend time in God's word this morning to, 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 to cause you to grow in his grace and knowledge? To, to bring you into a, a, a mindset of worship so when you entered into the service this morning, you weren't coming for someone to try to inspire you to worship God, but you already were worshiping God. And when we came together as a body of Christ, we were already ready to worship. And when we came to, to celebrate a remembrance, that we were already remembering that we were having it, so that when we celebrated it together, we weren't having it, taking it in vain, inappropriately. Paul was using up every second that he had for the kingdom of God. In our mind, that makes him an extraordinary person. But he was just an ordinary guy who was sold out for the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? He had an extraordinary calling. You have it, I have it. But he was sold out for the kingdom of God. And he's willing to die for it. That's what he said. I'm not only willing to be persecuted, I'm willing to die for the name of Jesus. Would we be able to say that? Well, that's where we pull into this then. Paul's going to have three conversations, three, three um, interactions, if we would, today. And we're going to see Paul going through each one of these things, okay? The first is the conversation that he's going to have with the commander of the army. And the very first thing I want you to look to consider is, again, I love to consider each individual in a certain in the situations and place myself in their plot spot and say, well, you know, what about this? What about this? Because I can be condemned right alongside the Sadducees and Pharisees, you know. But would I do what Paul had done? Well, Paul's demeanor. Think about this. When when he starts to have this conversation, he's not yelling. He's not yelling. I have um, some of the um, um, 
references there. You can look at the word for yelling and stuff like that. But the crowd's yelling. In a few moments, we're going to see him cry out when he's in the, in the council because it's loud and he needs to get everybody's attention. But there are words for yelling. There are words for crying out. There are words for lifting up your voice. He's not. Literally, he turns and he speaks to the soldiers. Do you understand what's happening right now when he turns to speak? Speak. Talk to the soldiers. He's getting ready to be what? Scourged. Scourged. So what is literally, you watched the Passion of the Christ, right? What happens? What does it look like? So others of you have seen Passion of the Christ. What does it look like when someone's going to be scourged? What's happening? Excuse me, Donald. Could you come with me for a moment? We'd like to beat on your back. Oh, you don't want to? But let's, let's try to encourage you a little bit better. They don't use the, the, proper, the, the, the current philosophy of trying to get a child to do what they're supposed to do. The Romans did what? Get out of you! Get out of And they got a pole. And they drag him over and they put him to the pole. And they tie him to the pole. This is all happening to Paul at this very moment. What do you think, gentlemen? Do you think this is a, a pleasurable moment? Uh, excuse me, could you bring me a spot of tea at the moment? <laughs> I mean, we're having such a pleasurable moment. This interaction is so delightful. I'm so glad that you're choosing to, to bring me into a cultural awareness of, of what happens on this side of the barracks. It didn't happen that way. Could you imagine? You're being dragged. You're being this. And Paul, in the midst of all this thing, turns around and says what? Excuse me. Por favor. One moment. I have a question for you. We'll get to the question in a moment. But that leads me then to thinking about all these Proverbs about my lips, and about how I respond to situation. A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. What do you think it would be if you were being dragged by the cops, the police, but we'll make them better, cops, the bad cops. You're being dragged, right? For something it, you're not accused of. I mean, you, you were accused of, but you didn't do it. You're falsely accused. It doesn't really matter. But you're being dragged, and you start to fight against them because you're being unjustly grabbed. What do you think would happen at that moment? Oh, we're sorry. Uh, pardon us. We didn't know that you were unjustly accused at this very moment. No, they're not going to do that. What are they going to do? They're going to unjustly drag you more and harder. They're going to beat you down. i got sons and sons-in-laws who were cops. I get it. The reality is, if we ever have a, a, a moment where you know, have an active shooter or whatever, and we get to that part, and you have your guns, we're telling you, when the, when the police officers come, what's the first thing you need to do? Not even this. You lay down. Lay down. Put your gun out in front of you. There's a certain spot where you understand submission. You understand? It's wisdom. You fight against it, something bad's going to happen. Okay? They're only doing their job, okay? The Roman soldiers, whether we like how they did their job or not, didn't matter. They were only doing their, their job, okay? There was a riot going on in Jerusalem. This guy is in the middle of the riot. He's causing the riot. They don't know whether he's right or wrong or whatever, so they grab the guy who seems to be the middle of the, this whole thing, right? And they're dragging him up, and they want to find out what's going on. And they're using the, the modus operandi that they had. They're going to beat the truth out of this guy because they're expecting, they're expecting this Jew to lie. Paul would have went right into it. He'd have been the fool if it had just started fighting against it. A fool's lips enter into contention. His mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction. His lips are the snare of his soul. A fool vents all his feeling, but a wise man holds them back. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Do we act that way sometimes when we're kind of being pressured in the moment? You know, rather than biting our tongue, rather than trusting God, we want to do what? We just want to explode back. And all that does is do what? Throws more fuel to the fire, right? A fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. Who's got the shame at this very moment in our situation? Is it Paul? Does Paul have shame? He doesn't really have shame. He knows it. He knows God's word. He knows God's truth. He knows who he is. We're going to read about his clear conscience in just a moment. 
The shame belongs to the Jews. The shame belongs to the Romans. He's being unjustly accused by the Jews, and he's being unjustly persecuted, if you would, at this moment, getting ready to be beaten by the Romans. So Paul, in his love, if you would, is covering a multitude of sins at this moment. Okay? By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well-advised is wisdom. The beginning of strife is like the re- releasing of water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. I mean, I had to memorize this verse over and over and over again. And all these verses are b- verses that Bob knows so well from experience. Bob's mouth got him into trouble so often. Still does. It's under control a whole lot more than it was 30 years ago. But you know the old uh, saying, right? It's better not to speak and let them think you're a fool than what? (laughs) Opening your mouth and prove it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's just it. So Philippians 4, 4 4-7, rejoice in the Lord. How often? Who wrote this? Who? Paul. Hmm. Paul. And do you know where he wrote this from? Prison. Roman prison. Roman prison. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. How can you be gentle? Because you know what? God's here with you. Does it make sense? So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. Right? Be anxious for how many things? Nothing. Nothing. Be anxious for Nothing. Well, I mean, honestly, I think at this this is a, a good moment for Paul to be anxious. <laughs> he's being dragged by a bunch of Jews. Right now, he probably he might have cracked ribs, bruised ribs. I mean, he's probably not feeling very good at this moment. And now he's being dragged, and he's on that stake. He's getting ready to be scourged. At this moment, I think I have just a, a slight reason to what? Be anxious. But Paul says, be anxious for Nothing. Nothing. Rather, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, God, I am so thankful that the Jews are beating me to shreds. And I'm so grateful that I'm in chains by the Romans and ready to be scourged for something I didn't do. No way! But that's what Paul's saying. And he said earlier in the letter, in chapter 1, that it was because of his bonds in Christ that many were having boldness to preach the word boldly as well, and that many in the household of Caesar were actually coming to faith. And so he recognized that even the situation that he was in, God was using it for the advancement of the kingdom. He was sold out for the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Paul. But if I'm sold out for the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, I don't want to be thrown into jail. Because I got better things to do with my life than to witness to a bunch of other prisoners who deserve to be there when I didn't deserve to be there. They deserve to be there. Because, you know, I mean, they did things to be there. No. If God wanted me to be there, and that's how Paul saw it. It's there for a reason. Thanksgiving. Let your request be known unto God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. The anchors of the fruit of the Spirit. We like to talk about the love, joy, peace, but we forget about the gentleness and self control. They kind of go hand in hand. They kind of go hand in hand. But you know the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, dissensions, jealousies. That's those verses that came just before it. Those are the works of the flesh. And I always have to ask myself, which one am I more representing at this moment? Do I look more like the flesh or do I more, look more like the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is that which is going to come out in your life when the Holy Spirit is vibrant in your life, when he's working through your life. If love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control is not being evidenced in your life, then probably the Holy Spirit is not running through the veins of your life. Paul 
clearly is exuding the fruit of the Spirit. The word of God that has been hidden in him, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee, has been hidden in his heart. That even at this moment, when the greatest squeezing could be happening in a life, in my mind, he's exuding the truth of God's word. And he is emulating it for us to see. His demeanor. His question then, is it lawful to discourage an uncondemned Roman? Paul knew his rights as a Roman citizen. He had declared the similar thing in Philippi. That's what the reference is in Acts 16. The similar thing in Philippi. And we'll come back to that moment in a moment. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on Romans 13, other than just to remind you of what Paul, again, declared to the church of Rome. And that is that they were to be subject to every higher power, right? To the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Who was the governing authority when he wrote this? Caesar. Which Caesar? Potentially Nero. The guy who was really persecuting the church, using Christians as light poles putting tar on them, lighting them up. Not a good guy. And Paul is writing and saying, look, but these are the guys you're supposed to submit to. Because whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. He got it. He lived it. He was there. He's submitting to these Roman authorities as they're getting ready to scourge his back. But he knew the legal law as well as he knew the moral law. He knew his rights as a Roman citizen. Can I ask you a question before you scourge? Wait, 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 before you, wait, wait, oh, oh, hold your hand. Wait, wait, wait. Is it lawful for you to scourge, now the critical term, an uncondemned Roman citizen? Is not necessarily is it lawful for you to scourge a Roman citizen. Keyword, in uncondemned, you have not proven my guilt yet. If he's guilty, let the scourgings begin. Make sense? But I'm uncondemned. You have every right to whip anybody you want. But you can't whip a uncondemned Roman citizen. Because that goes into this declaration. Because where it goes now, (laughs) the centurion's like, whoa, we are in bad trouble. And he goes to the commander, uh, um, you better be careful. This guy says he's a Roman citizen. Could Could you imagine the commander at this moment? I don't know whether he's panicking or whether he is very angry. Because he doesn't believe Paul. Paul's just a what? Just a lion Jew. Have you ever met people that knew how to play the game? They say the right words, and they stop you in your track because just in case, right? And they're buying time. And now you have to prove that they're not right. Make sense? And they're going to buy time. So he comes down and he says, are you a Roman citizen? I had to spend a lot of money to get my citizenship. And Paul throws the, the thud moment on him. But I was born one. See, Paul was from Tarsus. Tarsus was a free city. You can read plenty of Epigen and Dio Chrysostom, which all testify to the fact that Tarsus was a free city. You say, what's the big deal about a free city? A free city were granted partial autonomy and permitted to use their own laws, customs, and magistrates, and their citizens were free from being subject to Roman guards. Philippi was also a free city. That's why, if you remember in Philippi, when Paul was thrown into prison without a trial, he and Silas just thrown in prison, 
locked up, right? Chained. Earthquake comes. Romans, uh, the guard comes and he says, don't kill yourself. Don't kill yourself. We're all here. Everybody, we're all still here having a big party. We were worshiping God, man. It was a good service. And God must have been listening, right? Because he says what? What must I do to be saved, right? So takes care of his wounds. Next morning, the, the, the council comes together, and, the, and they're all talking in the city council, and they want to what? Let Paul go, right? Paul says what? Not in your life. Not in your life. I want them all to come down here, and I want them to apologize. And I want them to personally walk me out of this prison. Why is that? Because I'm a free citizen. Now, he didn't state it that way, but that's what, how it plays out. He's a Roman citizen. He's a free citizen. And right now, he can have their head. If he wanted to press it, he'd win. And all those council members, off of their heads. That's exactly how it plays out for the centurion and for the commander at this moment. That centurion is probably so glad that he stayed his hand. Paul says, I was born one. Y'all, know your rights. I don't preach political messages. I try to stay away from them. But know your rights. We honor the governing authorities. But know your rights. As an American in the military, I gave my oath. But I didn't give an oath to the president. I didn't give an oath to Congress. What do you swear your oath to, Rodney? No, nope, not even to the country. Well, God and country is what we live for. The Constitution of the United States. Support and defend. So help me, God. Know, know what you've sworn to defend. Know your rights. Defend your rights, but with gentleness and meekness. As pa Peter states in 1 Peter 2, that when you are unjustly persecuted, do you get it? You can be like Jesus. And the whole idea is that we draw attention to Jesus in a positive way, not in a negative way. When did, has the church grown the greatest throughout history? Through persecution. We don't like persecution. But it's when people find out who's real and who's not real. And they find out what the realness is. And this commander is learning realness through Paul right now. This guy has got it together. He's being beaten, and yet he's teaching truth. So the commander wants to know more, though. He's got to find out more. I mean, I, I, he is really bewildered. I mean, I, I get his spot. I, I mean, he's in a tough spot. I mean, who's this guy? I mean, I got all of Jerusalem wanting to kill this guy, and yet this guy, he's turning around and he's telling me he's a Roman citizen. Who is this guy? So, he sends him to the Sanhedrin. And Paul now has this confrontation with the council. The first thing he does is he declares his what? His clear conscience. He says, I've, I, I've lived this life before. And it reminds me of 1 Timothy 1, where Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because of you counted me faithful, putting me into ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I don't have time to get into this the uh, little side theology concept here, but even in the Old Testament, the the sacrifices, the offerings were given sins that were performed in ignorance. And when you became, when you do things purposefully, it raises the stakes before God. Doesn't mean that you can't be forgiven. But those are purposeful. David 
declares at the end of Psalm 19. He asks God, he says, keep me from sins of presumption, from presumptuous sins. Do you know what it means to presume? Not an assumption. It's a presumption. It's pre- presume. You assume, well, I guess assumption, assume it ahead of time. But the idea is that, so should I continue to sin that what? Grace be unbound. Paul says what? May it never be so. May it get a God forbid. But we do that. Because God will what? He'll forgive me. He'll wink the eye. Do you know what God thinks of your sin? It's a point. It's a stench in his nostril. He hates it. So never, never, never let it be to the point where, oh, but it's okay. God will just forgive me. Don't go there. I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. And then he goes on, he says, For this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. God was using me. This is Paul speaking. God was using me. I was the chief of all sinners. I mean, I'm the worst of the worst. I'm the bad of the bad. I'm the wicked of the wicked. And God still saved me. And he wants to save you. It doesn't matter what you've done. I did it all. I was a murderous blasphemer. And God saved me. Think about that. But I have a clear conscience before God. What does that get him at this moment? Slap! Slap across the face. That brings him then with the denunciation of Ananias. Some verses about who Ananias is as the high priest there. But I, what I want to just share with you real quick um, is that this proclamation this is actually a prophecy. God shall smite you, you whitewashed. Um, whatever he says at that moment. Not sepulcher. That's Jesus. Jesus. Say it again. Wall, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so anyways, but Matthew 3, Matthew 23, that's John the Baptist and Jesus both um, uh, just showering um, scourgings, on, if you would, verbal scourgings on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But this prophecy actually came true. So Josephus wore the, um, wore the Jews, and I'm not going to read through all this, but you can see the parts here is that he's talking about Eleazar, the son of Ananias, the high priest. So Ananias was a high priest when Jerusalem fell. Okay, So the same guy, Ananias, who was the high priest, was the high priest when, when Jerusalem fell to Rome. Okay, when the Romans came in. Um, and it was actually his son, a very bold youth, who was at the time governor of the temple, persuaded those that officiated in the divine service to receive no gift or sacrifice from any foreigner. And this was the true beginning of our war with the Romans because Caesar always wanted to have his sacrifice at the temple of Yahweh. And so they said, nope, not anymore. We're not going to take Foolishness. Foolishness. And so... For God, could be, but honestly, they weren't doing it for, for, the, for the name of God. They were doing it for power. And so, Eliezer says no, and that becomes the big part of the war. So, it goes on, so I'm dropping through. You can see this book 2, chapter 17, coming down through. It says, the men of power, per- perceiving that the sedition was too hard for them to subdue, and that the danger which would arise from the Romans would come upon them first of all, endeavored to save themselves, and sent ambassadors, some to Florus, the chief of which was Simon, another son of Ananias to Agrippa. So Agrippa, so Ananias is in the midst of all this, trying to, to save his own hide. Okay? The seditious grew bolder and carried their undertaking further, insomuch that the king's soldiers were overpowered by their multitude and boldness, so they gave way and were driven out of the upper city by force. The others then set fire to the house of Ananias, the high priest, ooh, into the palaces of Agrippa. So what happens when you're trying to please all the people all the time? Say it again. You can't. It always comes back to bite you. The same people that you're trying to appease are the same people that ultimately will, will tear you down. Okay, and we see it in our in our, gov- our politics today. Okay, as long as you tote the the, the party line, as you, as long as you um, do political correctness, you're good. But the minute you step outside it, you are gone. You're toast. Well, that's what happened here. Okay, so they set 
fire to all those places. But then notice in the brown, this is kind of fun, after, the, after which they carried the fire to the place where the archives were, were posited and made haste to burn the contracts belonging to their creditors <laughs> and thereby to dissolve their obligations for paying their debts. And this was done in order to gain the multitudes of those who had been debtors and that they might persuade the poorer sort to join in their insurrection with safety against the more wealthy because now the wealthy couldn't prove what? That they were actually in debt. So look at that. We set you free. Now join us, right? Anyways. You can just kind of take that wherever you want to go with it. But paragraph 9, but on the next day, the high priest was caught where he had concealed himself in an aqueduct. In an aqueduct. And Ananias had, had gotten to the point where he was actually hiding in the water trough, an aqueduct. And he was slain together with Hezekiah, his brother. And so then you had the death of the high priest. So Paul's words came true. God actually brought Ananias to his death in the midst of all of those things, and slew him, okay? So then Paul says what? Paul realizes that there's the, the splitting between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He knows that because he's been there, and he realizes at the moment things aren't good, so let's just bring it out where the words at. This is why I'm being persecuted. And he declares it. And he cries out above the, above the din of the noise, and he says, I'm being persecuted because my beliefs as a Pharisee. Now, really, it's not because of his beliefs as a Pharisee, but it really is. I mean, he goes to the fact that he believes in the resurrection. He believes in the Messiah that's going to come, right? And so he's going to take these cards, and he's going to use them. Again, you've got to understand and know the things that you believe, and you have to be able to, with wisdom, know how to act in these situations. Now, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, say, well, about Paul and all this kind of stuff, but I think Paul did this purposely. I knew... I think Paul knew exactly what was going to be the result of it, okay? And so, so he cries it out. And what happens? Exactly what I think, I believe, that he knew would happen. Pharisees take a side. Well, if he's seen an angel, note they don't say who? The Messiah. <laughs> but if he's seen an angel, if he's, seen any, if he's heard the voice of an angel, who are we? To this, I mean, because you know, we, we believe in the resurrection. We know the Messiah is going to come and all this kind of stuff. And we define no fault in this guy. I feel bad for the Roman commander. It's getting, this is getting worse because he hasn't got a clue. This is getting into Jewish law, getting into Jewish scripture. He hasn't got a clue, and he doesn't have a position. Does it make sense? But now what's he going to do with this guy? We'll pick that up next week. But the final little interaction that Paul has is with Jesus because Jesus comes to him, and this is important to me. It's going to be very quick, but it's very important. It's a very quick moment. Why did Jesus come to him? Look at the first thing he says to him with his exhortation. Be of good cheer. It's the word courage. It's the word that we see in John 16, 3. These things have I written unto you, that in me you have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have pressure situations. But be of good courage. Be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. Jesus comes to remind Paul this. So here's, here's the deal. I just got done talking about all this about Paul and how he handled all this and he knew where it was and he was anxious for nothing and everything. But I wonder that inside of him, where there's just a little bit of what? Just a tinge of anxiety. Just a little bit that's there. You know? I mean, we always have just a little bit of something, right? And I think it's really kind of cool because Jesus met him where he was. And he comes to him in the, in the cell, and he says, Paul, be of good courage. i got greater plans for you. Just what you knew was going to happen is going to happen. Because then he says to him, you must also bear witness at Rome. Paul knew. Do you remember? He knew he was going to go to Rome. He declared he was going to go to Rome. But I think he thought he might go to Rome after the persecutions, that he would be freed, and he was just going to go. But I got plans for you, Paul. All those things that you knew are going to happen, just not in the way you thought maybe they'd happen. I'm sending you to Rome. I'm sending you to Rome. You're not choosing to go to Rome. 
Do you track that? There's a slight difference there. I'm sending you. God wants to use you. You're just an ordinary person with an extraordinary calling. But it may not work the way you want it to work. Are you willing to use whatever the situation you're in for the glory of God? So in the end, maybe, try it again. How do you handle stress? How do you handle stress? Secondly, then, how often are you in God's word and in his presence? Do you handle stress with patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness? Or do you go, is there a correlation between the first two answers? There is, you know. The more you're in God's word, the more you're in his presence, the more likely you're going to be controlled by him and not by your flesh. We wonder why things go the way they go. And I appreciated, Jose, your, your statement even in the devotional. We remember to pray when things are bad, not good, bad. And when things are good, we do think, wow, well, you know, we're just going flying on. But all of a sudden things start to go bad and we go, what? Oh, God, you're there. Yay. Remember me, you know? But it's supposed to be a daily event. Can I challenge you again? It's like a dead horse sometimes. But quiet time in the morning, start with it. It's, it's got to be an unshakable, unbreakable for you. It, it has to be where you're going to start every day. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in the season. Whatever he does shall prosper, right? That word for meditate is also then the concept of a cow chewing the cud. So the cow's out in the heat of the day and it starts chewing. Why? Why does it chew it? Cud. It's like Burger King coming back, you know, but they got multiple stomachs. But why does, it, why does a cow chew the cud? It's all nutrients. Nutrients? Mm, probably was doing that already. Not nutrients. Thirsty again. Curtis, you got animals? When do they eat? When are they, when are they out in the, in the field? Throughout the day, but when are they eating for the most part? In the morning, when the dew's on it. Why do they do it? So they get the, the water, so they get the, the, the refreshment, not just the nutrients, but the refreshment. So later on in the heat of the day, they bring it back up, and they're getting more fluids into their system so they can be refreshed in the heat of the day. If you're not reading and digesting God's word in the morning. When you need it in the heat of the day, you're going to... It's like dry heaves, man, because there's nothing there for you. There's nothing worse than dry heaves. I mean, I don't like heaving as it is, but dry heaves, that's even better. You know? Look at the word of God like a buffet. Some of us like buffets in the morning. I mean, we ain't going to miss breakfast. Egg, sausage, bacon, give me some coffee, what are they, you know? The word of God is more important than physical food. If you ate God's word like you, or if you ate physical food like you ate God's word, what would you look like? Oops, I heard that. But you ought to be eating God's word even more so than physical food. Are you more committed to the expansion of your kingdom or God's? It's a huge deal. When we go knocking on doors on Wednesday nights, we give them a tract regarding the church. But John, you can testify to this, right? It's not about our church. It's about the kingdom of God. We tell them right off the bat, we're not out looking for to steal, steal sheep, steal members. We're not, I mean, 
you know, honestly, this is just information. If you desire to, to, to come to the church, that's fine. But we just we want to see you in relationship with Jesus Christ. I really don't care where you go to church. I do to some degree, but I don't. That's between you and God. Are you worrying about your kingdom or God's kingdom? And finally, is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for you. Thank you again for the life of Paul. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to learn through him about what a committed life might look like. Just as you used Joseph, just as you used Daniel, and there was nothing special necessarily about them other than their committedness to you. So you used Paul in a mighty way. Lord, I pray that you would help us to desire to be fully committed to your kingdom and your righteousness. That we would seek it first. That we wouldn't be worried about what we're going to wear, where we're going to live, what we're going to eat, where we're going to go. Forgive us, Father, for look into the things of the world with more anticipation than the things of your kingdom. Help us to be prepared, Lord, through reading your word, studying your word, memorizing your word, to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within us with meekness and fear, that you might be glorified. Lord, help us to, to know our our, our rights as citizens of this land. You have allowed us to be born in this land at this time for such a time as this. So Lord, help us to be prepared in that light as well. But only in a way that it brings you glory, Lord. Not that we're worried about our own selves. Thank you, Lord, for those that you're using in our land to proclaim your truth and to defend our liberties. Forgive us, Father, for, look, for looking to the blessings rather than to the blesser. Be glorified in Christ's name. Amen.